Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. I wanted to go over the cases which I showed you, the different types of hemorrhages, and asked you to characterize them verbally. And I just wanted to review them briefly. Uh, the first is this case right here. What we see is a high attenuation abnormality overlying the right cerebral hemisphere, period. You see how that sentence tells us a lot and uh, it's good to end the sentence right there with that information provided, a high attenuation abnormality overlying the right cerebral hemisphere. You can see that it's outside of the substance of the brain. You can tell that it's pushing the brain to the left direction, in the left direction, and there's midline shift and you can see that there is a little bit of ventricle visible on the left but on the right you don't see any ventricle that's because it's compressed so the ventricle on the right side is not visualized presumably because it's effaced by the pressure you could characterize this as biconvex meaning curved outward from compared with the central portion of the lesion so this is biconvex kind of like a lens biconvex high attenuation abnormality which is an extra axial meaning outside the substance of the brain uh, uh, area of abnormality so it's not in the brain it's not in the ventricle it's outside the brain pushing upon the brain so a high attenuation, biconvex abnormality, uh, fairly uniform high attenuation with mass effect and midline shift. The lens-like or lentiform configuration, the, the, which is to say the biconvex configuration, is suggestive of an epidural hematoma. And indeed, uh, epidural hematomas most commonly will occur in this region because there's a, an artery embedded in the calvarium, the, mid, the middle meningeal artery, which if there's a fracture of the calvarium, that artery tears and blood accumulates. You have to appreciate that the dura is tightly adherent to the inner lining of the calvarium. That's why this acquires such a configuration because it's under a lot of pressure and there is a strong resistance to having the dura peel off and away from the inner margin of the calvarium. So that just means that this is under high pressure and which is why most epidural hematomas are due to arterial injuries as opposed to subdural hematomas which are due typically to a venous injury. So again, a high attenuation lentiform you could say or a biconvex abnormality overlying the right cerebral hemisphere with midline shift to the left most suggestive of an epidural hematoma. Here's a second case. This is a subdural hematoma. It's subdural and the subdural space is not under a lot of tension. It's not tightly adherent to the adjacent structures. So it's a potential space that can easily be opened up. So even some venous hemorrhage uh, can if there's a venous tear, a, a disruption of the veins overlying the brain, you can get this separation because unlike in the epidural hematoma where the blood is, a, is uh, accumulating between the skull itself and the underlying closely adherent dura, here it's a, the blood is accumulating between the dura and the arachnoid, a, a very feathery, thin, layer of tissue that overlies the hemisphere more centrally than the arachnoid uh, which in turn is more centrally 
position than the dura. So this is uh, concave as opposed to the biconvex epidural. We have a concave inner margin of this abnormality, typical of subdural hematoma. There's midline shift, and uh, the way to quantify the midline shift is to draw a line, and we can do this uh, on the, the CT imaging software packages that most radiologist groups have. We drop a line from here to here and measure the amount of midline shift from this point right here, which should be in the midline. It's the uh, interventricular septum. Here's the right lateral ventricle, which is actually to the left of midline now, and this is the left lateral ventricle. So we have significant midline shift, and I would give a quantification of that. It looks like it's probably one, two and a half centimeters probably, about two and a half centimeters midline shift to the left. Very often the contralateral or left-sided, in this case, ventricle will become a little bit dilated, and this looks a little prominent because it does not empty as readily due to the pressure on the central structures of the brain. So this is a subdural hematoma, very characteristic appearance of a subdural hematoma showing substantial midline shift. And then thirdly, here we have a high attenuation area of abnormality in the basal cisterns. The basal cisterns are potential spaces in the skull base. They are not epidural. They are not subdural. They are subarachnoid. So epidural is between the layers of the dura that are tightly adherent to the skull. And so that epidural means outside the dura, which is a tightly adherent area, which is why a lot of high pressure is required to create that. A subdural hematoma, however, is between the dura and arachnoid. So it's a potential space uh, and it's much easier to open up. So when you bleed into the subdural space, it doesn't acquire a lot of pressure. It's generally of a venous origin. So it doesn't have the pressure of an epidural hematoma and you get this characteristic uh, concave configuration and then deeper still is the subarachnoid hemorrhage that's between the arachnoid which underlies the dura and the pia which actually tightly invests the substance of the brain so between the arachnoid and pia is the uh, the subarachnoid space. So this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which often occurs as a result of a cerebral aneurysm rupture. And the cerebral aneurysm rupture bleeds into the subarachnoid space. And as you can see, the subarachnoid space freely communicates with a number of different areas of the subarachnoid space, uh, but particularly is evident in the supracellar cistern. This is above the cella tersica, where the pituitary is. So here you have the supracellar cistern, and going out into the sylvian fissures, which are the lateral fissures of the hemispheres bilaterally. So the sylvian fissures have blood in them. This is subarachnoid blood. This is all subarachnoid blood. This is subarachnoid blood around the pons. There's, there may be a little bit of blood that's leaked into the ventricular system, in this case, in the fourth ventricle here. This is cerebellum. 
Here you can see the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles look small and normal, so they're not obviously obstructed as yet. So just a summary then. Uh, epidural hematoma. We have an, a biconvex extraaxial high attenuation abnormality with mass effect and midline shift typical of an epidural hematoma. Here we have a crescentic, you could say, crescent-like, a crescentic extraaxial hematoma overlying the right cerebral hemisphere with significant midline shift to the left, suggesting a subdural hematoma. There's some enlargement of the left lateral ventricle uh, suggesting some degree of obstructive hydrocephalus. And then lastly, here we have a CT showing high attenuation in the basal cisterns, including the supracellar cistern and adjacent cisterns, including the sylvian fissure and the prepontine cistern with possibly a small amount of blood in the fourth ventricle, typical of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay.